Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to the March Plant Tests and Pathogens. So you have to remember to turn the music off once you turn it on. Um, we're excited to have you all here today. We have um, our guest speaker is going to be Inga Meadows. I'll be introducing her in just a minute. Um, and she will be talk to, talking to us about phytophthora resistant plants. And that will be followed by Be on the Lookout, the BOLOs, which are insect pests and plant diseases that will be coming up in the next few weeks. We'll have Matt Bertone and Mike Munster from the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic sharing those. And I will follow up and finish things off with our Plant These Instead feature and the Extension Master Gardener Program announcements. So we're going to jump right in and um, I'm going to introduce Inga, um, and we're really excited, Inga, to have you here today. Inga Meadows is an extension plant pathologist for vegetables and herbaceous ornamentals with NC State University. She works out of the Mountain Research Station in Waynesville, North Carolina, and her extension and research focuses on improving the management of diseases of tomato, other vegetables, and greenhouse ornamentals. And today she's specifically going to be telling us about this phytophthora, which is a soil-borne disease. It's very devastating if you have it. Not a lot you can do. So you have to choose um, alternative plants that are resistant. So she's going to be sharing with us some of her research that looked into annual and herbaceous perennial plants that were held up pretty well in those sites. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Inga. I'll stop sharing, and you can start your share. And um, welcome, and we are so glad to have you here today. All right, thank you for the introduction, Charlotte. I'm gonna see if I can get this going. I'm assuming you can see my screen now. Yes, looks great. Hopefully you can hear me okay. Yep, sounds uh, good. Okay, so as Charlotte mentioned, I'm, I'm a extension plant pathologist. I'm in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. Um, and today we're going to talk about Phytophthora and some sustainable approaches to managing Phytophthora infested landscape beds. Um, it might get a little sciencey in here, but that's okay. Don't get bogged down in that. What what the take home will be is um, if you if you do run into Phytophthora, then you you might have some plants you can plant in those beds. So. Um, uh, anytime we talk about a disease, we have to sort of start with what the, what that disease is. So what is Phytophthora root and crown rot? I know the word Phytophthora is a bit of a mouthful. Um, you don't have to necessarily say it. It's basically a, a genus of fungal-like organisms. We call them oomycetes. You may have um, heard them referred to as water molds. But basically, they're, they're more closely related to algae, but they act like fungi. So that's why we call them fungal-like. They really like wet conditions. So any soils that are um, not draining well or holding water, the, if Phytophthora is present, it, it can reproduce rapidly through a, um, a structure we call sporangia that releases a swimming spore called zoospores. And once conditions become not so conducive, maybe when the soil dries out, uh, the Phytophthora can survive as um, these survival structures or spores, um, sometimes O spores. There's another term called clonidospores. Those aren't important. The important part is they really prefer those wet conditions, but they can survive for a long time um, when conditions are not conducive. And I've got a little life cycle down there in the bottom right that demonstrates the, the, the life cycle. Um, just to show you some, some landscape plantings that have suffered from Phytophthora, this is from the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic, um, where you see not a full planting there. There's um, uh, Phytophthora was uh, diagnosed in this bed when the plants were sent in to the clinic, this is what they looked like. And you may notice there are no roots here. It looks like the Phytophthora has eaten up all the roots on these plants. And they also show some yellowing and maybe some stunting in there. Uh, so what's susceptible to Phytophthora? There are many species in this genus of Phytophthora. Some are host specific, so they may only attack one host or one plant or one species, while others have a large host range. 
Um, in North Carolina, on the annuals and herbaceous perennials, and I'm just talking about ornamentals here, um, there's about three to four species that have a, a relatively large host range, medium to large, I would say, but common susceptibles, susceptible plants include petunia, annual vinca, pansy, calabrocoa, and there are a number of others, but those are probably the, the common ones we run into. And the picture on the bottom right shows um, vinca seedlings that came into the clinic um, that had phytophthora on them. So obviously you'd like to see um, healthy vincas in every one of those cells, but the cells that don't have vincas suffered from phytophthora. So how, how do I manage phytophthora if I get it? Um, well, we always say it's best if you can avoid it. So if you know that there's a bed or a field that you're working in that has Phytophthora, wash those tools um, and any equipment that you use in those beds before moving to another bed. Um, improve drainage. If, if you have areas in a, in a bed or a field that um, aren't draining well, try to improve drainage or manage irrigation, how frequently you irrigate in there. Use resistant varieties. So this is the obviously the topic I'm going to talk about today. Um, and then another option, at least for landscapers and some homeowners may use fungicides. Um, the problem is they're costly. You know, you have to buy the product, but you also, um, for landscapers, they have to pay um, labor costs to apply that those products. And it's not just a one-off. You have to keep re, um, reapplying. And they may not um, uh, be a hundred percent effective. You may still have a plant or two that succumbs to Phytophthora. So obviously using resistant varieties would be the best option. Um, years ago, I guess in 2010, um, a group of plant pathologists at a, a meeting that they have every other year came up with a list of plants that they had not seen Phytophthora on in their clinics. So they had a list of annuals, perennials, and woody plants that they thought might be resistant or tolerant just because there was a lack of um, samples coming into the clinic. And so an extension publication was created at NC State summarizing this information. So this is the annual ornamental plants list. And then this next page is the herbaceous ornamental plants list. Um, what I wanted to do was take this list and basically ground truth it. So um, because a lot of this information was based on anecdotal information, but let's see if, if it's true. Um, so our question basically was, are cultivars within these species actually resistant to multiple Phytophthora species that occur in North Carolina? So uh, we chose plants that were in this list that were available, that we could get our hands on. Uh, we chose ones that were popular or, or you know, desirable by um, consumers. Um, we stuck with annuals and perennials. We didn't evaluate any woody plants. And we also wanted plants that had some sort of general disease tolerance already. So for example, we didn't want to select an impatience that was susceptible to downy mildew because downy mildew can be pretty aggressive on impatience. So we'd only select um, those that were resistant to downy mildew. Um, and Obviously, we used that list from 2010 that I showed you. We also selected some known susceptible control plants. So in each landscape bed that we built, and I'll show you those beds in a minute, we wanted to put in plants that we knew would succumb to Phytophthora just to make sure that all the plants that we're evaluating are exposed to that Phytophthora, that whatever we put in there as far as the Phytophthora species did survive and were able to cause disease. Um, so the Phytophthora that we used um, uh, are listed there, Phytophthora nicotiani, P. drescheri, tropicalis, excuse me, my phone just dinged. Um, and all of these were from North Carolina, from ornamental plants in North Carolina. There are a couple we didn't have, um, but interestingly, one species did show up 
in our bed in 2018 that we hadn't put there. Um, likely it came from one of the plants that we planted in there or it came from, from soil or maybe we introduced it, we're not sure. But the point is that we wanted to evaluate um, resistance or tolerance to multiple species of Phytophthora, not just one or two. So we took, um, sorry, at, at three research stations, one in Mills River, one in Waynesville, and one in Salisbury, and you can see a map there. Oops, sorry, the map's on the next page. I'll show you where these places are located. Um, three research stations in North Carolina. We built three landscape beds, 10 by 20, and where we, um, we filled them with um, compost, com a mix of compost and screened uh, soil. We collected our plants from different greenhouses and nurseries in the state. And I would say 90 to 95 of the plants that we evaluated were donated. So it really was neat to see the support from the greenhouses in our state for this project. Um, so we did this in three years. I hadn't mentioned that yet, but May 2018, 19, and 20 was when we established our plants. We inoculated them with those species of Phytophthora that I mentioned in the first in the previous slide. So we allowed the plants to grow a little bit. Then we introduced the inoculum. We did use pine bark mulch um, and soaker hoses to water. Um, we used the mulch just to demonstrate, to simulate um, what one would do in their own landscape bed. And then the soaker hoses were placed in there. We did want to overwater them um, because as I mentioned a few slides back, the Phytophthora is really like a, a wet soil. So we wanted to encourage a little bit of disease there. And then we evaluated the plants every two to three weeks based on appearance and disease. So not only did we track whether they got Phytophthora, but we also tracked what other diseases occurred on the plants. Um, as the plants died or were dying, we would remove them and try to re-isolate the Phytophthora just to see was Phytophthora actually causing that disease. Um, and the PDIC, the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic, um, helped us with some other disease diagnoses that we weren't familiar with. Um, as I mentioned, here are the locations. So Mountain Research Station is over here by Waynesville. Uh, the Mills River Research Station is, is down here south of Asheville. And then we also did the Piedmont Research Station over here near Salisbury. So just to summarize how many plants we've evaluated, um, it did vary from 2018, 19, and 20. Um, you can see the list of, an or the, the numbers of annuals, numbers of um, annual cultivars and the perennial species and the perennial cultivars. Um, 2020 was a little bit less, as you can imagine, because of COVID. It was a little bit difficult to get plants in, in April and May when things were shut down. Um, nonetheless, we've been able to evaluate quite a number. And then at the bottom there, I have the susceptible plants that we used. So um, Gerbera daisy, Dusty Miller, Annual Vinca, and Petunia were our, our standard susceptible plants. And then I've got the cultivar there listed. And this is what one of the landscape beds look like, looks like. This was at the Mountain Research Station in 2018. So this is, um, this is actually probably right before or right after we're about to inoculate. So you can see the plants had, had adequate time to get themselves established before we inoculated. This bed also, um, you can see standing water over here. We didn't mean to, but we ended up putting it in a very wet spot. So this one looks like um, over the three years had more disease than either of the other two, but that's all right. And then just to show you a picture of what, what I mean when we say inoculum, um, it, it sounds very technical, but really what we do is the, we grow the Phytophthora on 
vermiculite, which has been soaked in V8 juice. And the Phytophthora really likes its tomato juice. So it works really well. We um, put the Phytophthora on the V8 vermiculite mix, allow it to grow for a couple weeks. And then we bring it out to the field or to the landscape beds. We dig these shallow trenches all through the bed and then just sprinkle this infested vermiculite throughout. And we did it actually twice each year. So um, here's a, the red lines sort of show where we um, put the inoculum. So we do it in one direction and then in the other direction so that we are really covering that bed with Phytophthora to make sure that all these plants are exposed to all, all three or four species of Phytophthora that we're using. Um, to show you what happens to some of the plants, um, this is a susceptible Gerber daisy. Um, so this was a known susceptible. We put it in there to make sure that it dies from Phytophthora and we got P. Nicotiana and P. Dreschleri recovered from this plant. So you can see it's not looking too healthy. Here's a Dusty Miller that also had a couple species of Phytophthora, another susceptible plant that we put in there intentionally. This is a petunia. Um, so you can see uh, just the stems, hardly any foliage, maybe some dead flowers there. This is annual vinca. That was another susceptible. So our, our inoculum, our phytophthoras were very active. Uh, before I show you the um, the healthy plants, the, the good resistant and tolerant ones, I wanted to show you some other diseases that we ran into um, where we couldn't evaluate those plants because of other diseases that showed up. This is Rudbeckia, um, where we got uh, verticillium, which is another soil-borne disease that causes a wilt. This is Gaiardia, um, where we had a white smut, which is another fungus um, that affects the foliage. Uh, this plant didn't die from the white smut. Um, it just, we just made note that it was susceptible to it. And then you, this is a pretty common one. Powdery mildew on bee balm is, is pretty common. So if you've, if you've grown bee balm in North Carolina, you've probably seen this disease. Um, pretty, pretty common. So on to the healthy plants. So these are the ones that we consider resistant or tolerant um, and ones that we would recommend in, in landscape beds that have Phytophthora. Um, Echinacea, so I'm just gonna roll through a few of them. These are all summarized in an extension publication that we have. So don't feel like you have to scramble to write these down or anything. I, I'll show you the link to our extension publication here at the end. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, another Echinacea um, cultivar. This is Lantana. And probably these are ones that maybe you've run, these cultivars are ones you've run into before. Um, this is a New Guinea impatiens. So the New Guinea impatiens are resistant to downy mildew. So these are a good option um, for North Carolina. This is annual vinca. So I will mention, um, this may get a little technical on you, but that's okay. Um, annual vinca is different with Phytophthora. Most Phytophtheras cause a root and crown rot. Um, but on annual vinca, there's, Phytophthora actually does not affect the roots. It actually affects the stem and foliage. And this uh, annual vinca, this Cora, they call it the Cora series. There's multiple cultivars within the Cora series that um, claim resistance to Phytophthora. And they are resistant to certain strains of Phytophthora, but what we have since found out is that some strains of Phytophthora actually can overcome this resistance. So here, this one did well, um, but that's because we happened to select, and we didn't know it, but we selected um, strains that the Cora could hold up to. 
So we do point that out in our extension publication. Just be aware of that. Uh, this is switchgrass. So we did evaluate some, some ornamental grasses as well. Another switchgrass. This is yarrow and celosia, uh, zinnia elegans, angelonia, another angelonia. Um, so just to summarize, we did evaluate over 52 cultivars of annuals over the three years and 42 cultivars of perennials. We've recommended a number there. I've given you the cultivars. Um, we rated these as excellent or in good condition. The other ones that we did not rate were either fair or poor or some other abiotic or biotic disease was going on that we felt like we couldn't um, reliably recommend those uh, cultivars. Um, 10 cultivars did die presumably from Phytophthora where we recovered Phytophthora and of course those aren't um, recommended. There are a few, few species where not all cultivars were susceptible. So um, within some species, there is some difference among cultivars, but that wasn't common. Um, and we probably will investigate that in the future. Uh, but all our susceptible plants died in all three years. So that was good. We got Phytophthora. We know the Phytophthora was active. Um, and in, as I mentioned before, we did find one species that we hadn't intentionally put there in 2018, but in following years, we did, we did add that one in. Um, I'm gonna skip those last two bullet points. Um, we did, I, I borrowed this um, presentation from another, another presentation. So we actually did, um, this is a peer reviewed journal article where we summarized this information. Um, but what's available to you are some of these resources. So as I mentioned, that NC State Extension publication is out there. I've got a link to it and let's see if, if I can get to it. Um, I guess I would have to stop sharing and share again, but I think we have time to do that. So let me try. I've got it, Inga. I can drop it in the chat. I think I've got the right. Let me see. I put a couple of links in the chat. I have the one you were trying to, to go for. Yep. I think that's it. That's the first one I put. Okay. Yeah. And so this just got updated with our 2020 results. Um, so it just gives you some background information, what we did, and then all the plants that we rated as excellent, good, and so on. Um, just to show you that, let me go back to my presentation. Um, we also have information, uh, if you want more information, we have some on our, our um, website, our lab website. There is a general disease fact sheet on Phytophthora blight and root rot. So if you want more information on what the disease actually looks like and what it does, there is that disease fact sheet. Um, and then of course, our handy NC State Plant Disease and Insect Clinic will also um, provide disease diagnostics and recommendations there. Um, with that, I think, hold on. Here's my last slide, just acknowledging the people who um, helped do this project, the, all the farm crews at the research stations, the area specialized agents, Amanda Taylor and Stacy Jones helped, helped us gather these plants from the different greenhouses. Um, it was actually funded by the Horticultural Research Institute for two years. Um, and then all the, all the nurseries and greenhouses that provided plants. Um, really made this effort happen. So with that, I think I'm ending early, but I'm happy to take questions or comments from anyone. Thank you, Inga, that, that was great. That was, that was great. Um, we do have a couple of questions. What about addressing Phytophthora in containers? Can it be in container plants? Um, what's your experience there? Folks are wondering. 
Yeah, so yes, Phytophthora can occur in container plants as well. Generally, how it gets in there is either um, from the plant, it might have come from the actual nursery or greenhouse that you got it from. Um, it can also, depending on where your containers are located, it may have come in from something around your house if you have Phytophthora and you were using the same tools in an infested bed. Um, and spreading it to a pot, but yes, it can it can occur in in pots. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. See yeah, and then I guess folks are thinking through um, when it's in a bed, um, how can you handle it besides planting resistant species? Can you remove the soil? How far does it spread? Yeah. Um, that kind of thing. Those are good questions. How far will it spread in the soil? Um, it, can, it can spread pretty far in the soil. Generally, you'll see a pattern where um, either water movement, you'll see the pattern in terms of water movement. So it'll generally move where the water is moving to. So um, if you have in a, in a garden, if you have a slope to your garden, you'll probably see the phytophthora spread downhill because it'll move with the water. Um, it can also spread with um, you know, tractor movement. So if you brought a, even a rototiller in there and you're rototilling, you can move that Phytophthora up a row or whatever pattern you're using in your, with your rototiller. Um, but it generally needs either water or a human to move soil, to move propagules. Um, do you need to remove all the soil to use the bed again? So this is an interesting question. If you have a landscape bed that's not too large, yeah, you can remove the soil. Um, you probably want to remove it at least to six inches deep, if not eight inches. The problem is, and, and then refill it. Um, the problem is you probably won't get rid of the Phytophthora. You just may delay when you see Phytophthora again. Um, so it's possible. And I, I did a tour down at um, Disney World and in there, apparently they remove all the soil, they remove the soil in their landscape beds and replace it every year, regardless of disease. So um, I used to think that was off the table as a management solution, but apparently it's not. If you have the means to do it, you can do it. Yeah. Um, there was an earlier question, Inga, just um, in general. Are you familiar, is Phytophthora more um, common in certain parts of our state than others? Has there been research or look at that? Um, that's a good question and probably not. Um, it can occur in all parts of our state. You may see different species depending on which crop is being planted sort of thing if you're talking about crops, but I don't think there's a spot in our state that you can avoid Phytophthora. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then someone is bringing up solarization. Uh, that's a good question too. Um, yes, you can. Solarization is, um, for those who don't know, solarization is where you would take a, a bed or a field, cover it in a plastic and let the soil heat up to a, a point that essentially kills um, the Phytophthora in that soil or other organisms. Um, the problem with solarization is one, you have to have, you have to do it during the hot part of the year. So it doesn't work in the winter. You have to do it during the summer. And that's usually when people want plants in their bed. Um, two, you have to get up to a certain temperature and maintain that temperature for a, a duration of time or it's not effective. Um, the problem with that is if you have two weeks of daily sunshine that might work but as you know in North Carolina that's hard to obtain so um, it can work it's just difficult to employ any preventative measures other than not overwatering um, there are some preventative measures so one thing I encourage people to do is avoid when you go to your um your garden store 
avoid the plants that don't look healthy. Um, I know some plant pathologists even that go straight for the second hand unthrifty looking plant shelving and buy their plants there and it's just embarrassing. But um, as master gardeners and agents, you guys need to avoid those unthrifty looking plants, not just for Phytophthora, but for other diseases. Um, other preventative measures, just keeping maintaining a healthy plant, um, maintain your soil pH that's um, appropriate for the plants you're growing. Um, don't over fertilize, don't under fertilize, try to give your plants what they need, not too much, not too little. Um, and those things will help. Is it possible to use a drench of hydrogen peroxide in it to uh, get rid of the phytophthora? Um, yeah, so hyd hydrogen peroxide, there are a number of different products that where the active ingredient is hydrogen peroxide. Um, it's, it's not so effective. The problem is that with soil and organic matter, you can really inactivate um, an active ingredient like hydrogen peroxide, and it's it's not it's not that effective. Um, there are other fungicide drenches that are mostly I don't know that there's any homeowner fungicide drenches available. I think not, but I could be wrong. There are some available for commercial use, like landscapers or greenhouses and that sort of thing. Um, and those are effective, but I don't believe any of them are available to the homeowner. I don't think there's any fungicides available to the homeowner that are effective. I could be wrong. I'm just not quite as familiar with homeowner products as I am with the commercial products. Um, I do know that a lot of the organic or biological based products are not that effective, um, unfortunately. Um, I see a question on, sorry, did I interrupt someone? No, not at all. I was, I was, I'm glad you're looking at the chat. That's helping me catch them as well. Someone was wondering about um, diagnosis. Could a homeowner diagnose uh, this without sending it to the lab or? That would be pretty tricky. Um, there's a number of soil borne diseases that have symptoms that look like Phytophthora root and crown rot. So it, um, unless they had a history of Phytophthora with that, with that plant and they knew what it looked like, they might be able to. But I would say in general, it'd be good to have um, an agent come out or send it to the clinic and, and get it d diagnosed that way. So unfortunately, there's not a uh, an easy diagnostic for it. Okay, thank you. But we have the fantastic plant and insect disease clinic at our disposal. So that's mm -hmm. a good thing. We do. I think we're caught up, Inga. Charlotte, um, how are we doing on time? Would you like to open it up for further questions or move along? Um, we're, we're really good on time. We have uh, just a few more minutes. If anybody does have a burning question, they want to, to get in here before we move on to our, our bolos. Could uh, someone ask, if she answered the question about tool cleaning? No. At the I bottom see, of the chat. Sorry, I, I see that question at the bottom. I'm sorry I didn't address that one. So the question is tool cleaning on tractors, tillers, garden tools, what is the recommendation? Yeah, so it is, I mentioned it is important to clean tractors and other garden tools. Um, first, get rid of any soil or plant debris that is on the, the tractor, any equipment. So that's the first step. Um, you can do that either brushing, brushing it off or using water, just wash it off. Um, second, and you may not be able to do this with tractors, um, but cleaning it with some kind of sanitizer. So um, on tools, you can use a dilute bleach solution. You can use um, a dilute ammonia solution. You can use um, a dilute Lysol. Any of those um, are effective. 
the problem with bleach or or ethanol if you have some sort of alcohol the the point is to um, have that sanitizer in contact with the tool for um, a duration of time um, it depends on the sanitizer um, but to allow that sanitizer to be effective before using it in the next next bed. So that's a good question. All right, do we have anything else? One last question. Anybody want to get in? I really appreciate it. This was fun to do and I liked very good questions and I hope it's helpful to some and I enjoyed giving the presentation. So thanks for having me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Inga. We really appreciate it. And I just wanted to echo the comment Matt Bertone made in the chat that you are doing wonderful work and are a huge asset to NC State Extension. So thank you so much for the work you're doing and for sharing it with us today. Mm -hmm. um, and we did drop those publication links in the chat and we'll include them in the follow-up email too so folks can learn more and um i'll just mention too inga had um shared her slides so we've got those posted you can review her slides as well so all that will be included in the follow-up email and um the recording link as well which will be posted on the extension master gardener intranet along with those resources so you can learn more thank you so much inga um i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and um have fun infecting more plants. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. And so now we're going to um, have our bolos be on the lookout. These are pest and disease issues that are going to be coming up in the next few weeks to months. And I'm going to turn it over to Matt Bertone and Mike Munster from the Plant Disease and Insect Clinic. See Please. who's going to be going first. Thanks, All right, Charlotte. great. Um, I think I'll go first, um, unless Mike has any uh, objections. But um, yeah, let me objections. share my screen. No objections? Good. No objections, Your Honor. Great. <laughs> All right. Everybody can see my screen, I hope. Um, yes. Great. All right. So some bolos. So um, the first one, be on the lookout for a new adjunct assistant professor with affiliate yeah. status. We wanted to congratulate uh, Charlotte Glenn for becoming uh, an assist, uh, adjunct assistant professor in Department of Horticultural Sciences. So she'll be able to now serve on graduate committees and perform other roles in the department, uh, but will continue her responsibility as a state coordinator for the NC State and Extension Master Gardener program. So congratulations, Charlotte. We just wanted to point that out and uh, say that's great. This is great news. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and now on to the critters. Um, so I just wanted to give a brief uh, bolos and a couple of things to be that people are chattering about. Of course, uh, first is going to be periodical cicada brood X, so brood ten, um, basically. And uh, though it's a little bit early to really be concerned about them or thinking about them, I just want to mention uh, what's going on. So they are going to be expected to emerge around May or June. Um, they're going to be mostly in our state. Uh, brood 10 is, uh, especially from more in recent records, are gonna be in the very far Western part of the state, uh, not much in the middle or the you know, middle Western part of the state. So Cherokee, Surrey, Wilkes counties, the most are the counties that be expecting these. Um, they are smaller black uh, and red and orange species than our annual dog day cicadas that come out later in the year that are gonna be green and large. Uh, these are about 75% the size of, of the larger ones. And of course, like I said here, you can see one very black with the red eyes and orange wings, uh, fairly distinct. And you'll be seeing, if you see them, you'll be seeing a lot of them. Uh, all three 17-year species are going to be coming out. That's uh, Septum Desin, uh, Cassini, and Septum Decula, uh, Magisicata species. Uh, they may cause flagging of branches, uh, should not kill mature trees uh, or healthy plants. They, they lay eggs in the branches of trees and, and bushes and things like that, uh, where the, lar where the, lar the nymphs uh, hatch and drop to the ground, burrow into the ground and feed on the plant roots for 17 years. Um, but that'll be out for a little bit uh, later. Uh, you'll probably see a lot of media um, uh, noise about the cicadas, no pun intended. Um, but uh, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm not an 
expert on them, but uh, there's a lot of good resources out there. Uh, these two sites, cicadamania.com and cicadas.ucon.edu are very good resources for all your information on cicadas out there. All right, also another refresher, large hornet refresher. So these, uh, the queens that were mated of social wasps, social paper wasps uh, and hornets last year uh, overwintered and they're gonna start to emerge. I've already gotten my first uh, identification request. Uh, so people will be concerned when they see large wasps that they are Asian giant hornets, also called murder hornets. Um, but be aware that we do have the native ones around here. Um, so the Southern Yellow Jacket are larger, uh, medium sized yellow jacket, orangish in color, the queens are with these two yellow stripes in the thorax. European hornets are about the size of Asian giant hornets, but have these little dots on the, their stripes on their abdomen and have a much more reddish head and thorax. Bald faced hornets are black with a very pale to white, a pale yellow to white markings on them. And paper wasps are thinner bodied, uh, come in a variety of colors uh, and, uh, and sizes, but can be common. So again, a lot of these queens that were mated last year have overwintered are now waking up, sometimes coming out of people's homes uh, where they've hibernated. And thus people are gonna start to get freaked out about these large wasps. So just be on the lookout. So for the typical ones, um, Box with leaf miner adults. These are orange uh, gnat like insects that are going to be flying around boxwoods in, a, in April once it starts to warm up and you get the new growth of the boxwoods. So, this is the best time to treat for the adults, which is going to be the stage it's mating and laying eggs. Uh, once the eggs are in the plant, it's a little bit more difficult to treat, although some systemics can may work, but uh, you will notice them swarming around your boxwoods, and that's a good time to treat. Uh, Eastern tent caterpillars and also forest tent caterpillars are going to be present uh, coming up soon. The Eastern tent caterpillars, these long uh, uh, fuzzy caterpillars, the white stripe down the back and this bluish uh, color markings. Uh, forest tent caterpillars are very similar, except instead of the white stripe, they're going to have little penguins or keyholes on their back. Um, these are emerging usually on cherries and prunus species and will then uh, make a little webbing nest in the uh, in the crotch of the tree. They may defoliate a little bit, but typically we don't see many issues, but just be aware that they're out there. Uh, carpenter bees and other wasps, uh, especially carpenter bees, may be aggressively defending your porch, looking for sites to, um, to burrow into. So the males right now with these large eyes and this yellow face are going to look at you aggressively. Uh, they cannot sting, but they're really defending these territories so that they can mate and the females can then start uh, building nests in the most ideal spots, which unfortunately is the wood, old, old wood in fences and porches and places like that for most homeowners. Everybody's going to ask how to get rid of them. It's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult to control or prevent them from doing so. I would say just make everything metal, uh, but we'll see. We have some research going on in the university to see what materials might be best or least conducive to carpet uh, destruction. Uh, now, if you're digging in the soil to prepare your uh, your you know turf or or gardens, you may find white grubs. Uh, at this time of year, they have overwintered as the larger stage, and they're getting ready to develop into adults coming May through July uh, for many of the species. Uh, so they're going to be waking up. They're going to be starting feeding again. Um, typically, they are not an issue, um, but you know if you have had issues in the past where you have turf that's very susceptible. Um, you know, just be aware that, that you may find them there. Uh, the damage wouldn't probably be seen until the fall in turf anyway. So just be aware if you find them, that doesn't mean it's a, a freak out time uh, about them being in the garden or in the soil. Uh, scale insects are gonna be mating and laying eggs. Uh, many of them, especially like these soft scales, this is a cottony maple leaf scale. Uh, the male, the females here, this disc, and the male is this fly-like insect. Uh, so soon enough, we're gonna have eggs, and then a little bit after that, the crawlers. And the crawlers are the most sensitive to chemicals, uh, but are typically the scales, unless on uh, trees that are smaller or stressed, are, are not usually an issue, but they can produce honeydew in certain groups, which will lead to city mold. And lastly, all of our favorite critters are starting to wake up. Uh, cockroaches, spiders, slugs, uh, all these things are going to be more active. Uh, I've seen a lot more cockroach nymphs in my house, especially these smoky browns. 
Smoky brown cockroaches, of course, are not a, a strict indoor pest. They're accidentally indoors. Uh, they can't survive for very long periods of time in our dry homes. But if you see these little small black and white uh, cockroach nymphs, uh, they may be emerging from an egg case that's laid nearby. Uh, but again, it's becoming much more act they're becoming much more active and crawling around the environment. Very, very common outside and happen to get indoors as well. But uh, be on the lookout for all these new things waking up. Um, and actually, uh, you know, I mentioned last last month uh, the ground nesting bees, and uh, Gina Myers actually sent me a great some great photos of the huge nesting colony of ground nesting bees. So they are definitely out there and active right now. And with that, I will turn it over to Mike to discuss his bolos. Very good, thanks, Matt. Um, as I'm pulling this up, what about? Um... The bloodsuckers, the mosquitoes, and the ticks are are they going to be? When do we have to start worrying about those? I think we've already seen mosquitoes at our house. Yeah, so um, those actually are an interesting thing because many of the species are active even in the winter when it warms up. So ticks can be found. Uh, I had a colleague who's collecting them up in Delaware in January. So as long as it's warm, they're going to be out. Now there are some uh, mosquitoes that overwinter as adults. And they, though, typically are not as uh, aggressive toward humans. They're more bird feeders and things like that. Uh, but we will soon enough start having mosquitoes. I would say it's going to be another month or so before we start getting them real bad. Once it gets really warm, uh, and hopefully if it doesn't get too wet in the spring, we won't have too many developing. Uh, ticks, though, uh, yeah, check for ticks. They are out. They're going to be out whenever it's warm out, basically. Well, that's discouraging. Um... And I did uh, just within the past week or so, I, I repaired the screens for the top of our rain barrels to make sure that the mosquitoes don't get in there and, and uh, lay their eggs when, when the rain barrels fill up. So I will be looking out for those. So let's share some uh, bolos here for diseases. Uh, hopefully. Okay, so hopefully everyone's seeing a Boa slide of woody ornamentals. We do. We've got, um, and this, of course, this is, I guess it's like the mosquitoes and the ticks, you know, they've, they've overwintered. The fungus Entomosporium has been overwintering on our evergreen Indian hawthorns. And for some reason, though, it just seemed like it was, it was brighter. It was more, um, it, it kind of, called my attention more just within the last week or so, seeing it in the in the landscape. But I don't know if that's subjective or if it's actually that the spots are somehow increasing in number or size, but you'll be seeing a lot of that. And of course, Fotinia isn't used that much in the landscape anymore, but that's another important host of this Entomosporium leaf spot that you see in the upper left-hand corner. Too early yet in our area anyway for the dogwoods to be blooming, but uh, the spot anthracnos is always something that we need to be watching for. Some years it's very heavy and I've seen it look like the tree got frosted. Other years you couldn't buy a spot from spot anthracnos. So it's going to depend on what the weather looks like as the bracts are opening. We talked a little bit about the generous sporangium rusts on juniper last month and uh, we did talk about quince rust, but now in April we'll be starting to see the telial horns forming on the cedar apple rust galls on the junipers, the spores that are formed there are gonna blow and find things like apples and crab apples to, to infect and complete their life cycle. The quince rust, that's the one that uh, we think is affecting our calorie pairs on the fruits that develop in you know, late May, early June timeframe, the papery membranous fruiting bodies with all the dusty orange spores. And I believe Charlotte's gonna have something to say about calorie pairs in a little bit here. Exobacidium leaf gall on camellias, both on the japonicas and the sasanquas, where the gall, the, the leaf turns into a gall as it develops, and it'll eventually get a white coating on it, which is where the spores are produced, and that may get some secondary fungi causing a darkening to it. But where you want to intervene is as soon as possible and pick those off before they have a chance to produce spores and continue the life cycle. There's only one life cycle per year. So you nip it in the bud quite literally, and hopefully you won't have so many infections in the buds overwintering for next year.
Continue with our woody ornamentals. As always, Phytophthora and Armillaria root rots can be problems on these hosts. They can occur at any time of year. And that's not necessarily when the infection occurred, but when the plant was stressed and then started to show symptoms because it's got compromised root function. So with all the wet weather we had in the winter, it's gonna be interesting to see what kind of a year we have for Phytophthora this year. Our canker and dieback diseases, which tend to be stress related and wound related. We'll be wanting to watch for a Phomopsis on Azalea. You see that in the bottom right picture there. Botrysphyria on Rhododendron, on Leyland Cypress and others. And uh, Ceridium canker killing the tips on Leyland Cypress as we talked about last month. Shot hole of cherry laurel, while well, the uh, one of our evergreens that still is kind of standing out because not everything else is leafed out yet but you may mistake this for insect feeding. You see the photo there in the lower left, but it's actually a disease and it's causing the plant to wall off the infection, which then drops out and gives you the unsightly effect there. Another cause of decline and unthriftiness on some of our plants, especially boxwoods and gardenias is root knot nematode. Those have a very wide host range, but just never forget that one of the things that might be going on with your plants could be a uh, nematode problem in the roots. And finally, for the woodies, euonymus, which would have had powdery mildew all through the winter as well, but as people are getting more active in their gardens, they may notice this and it can get quite dramatic on that particular plant. Shifting to our fruits and vegetables, you may start to see peach leaf curl, the reddening and twisting and bubbling of the, the leaf, as you see in the photograph there in the middle of the screen. Brown rot on peaches is gonna be in its blossom and twig phase. Later when the fruit are maturing, there's a, a fruit rot phase, but at this time of year is when you may get it in the, in the actual blossoms and, and spurs. And pear, which is the most susceptible of our different plants to fire blight, you may start seeing fire blade on that one as well, photograph in the far right. With vegetables, lithium root rot and damping off could happen, as well as you want to be careful about the over fertilization. The photograph there is from a sample that came in several years ago now, end of April, and those tomatoes, it was actually reported it was on a number of different varieties. And they had both root rot, phyto, excuse me, pythium, pythium root rot and high soluble salts, which would have been from over fertilizing. So we wanna watch those two things. And as always, again, repeating what Inga mentioned, be careful when you're selecting your transplants before they go out in the garden, make sure that they look healthy, even check the roots on those. And with your fruits, be sure that you've got your spray program in place. Not too much happening in the flower beds just yet, but uh, you may see some, if you have hollyhocks, you may see some rust on those. Also oxalis, volutella blight on pachysandra, which tends to be a problem when the plants get too much light or stressed by too much light because they do like the shade. And in the far right picture there, there's a photograph showing daylily leaf streak down the middle of the leaf. And also you can see in that same photograph, some leaf miners some like fine white tracks that are going across the leaf. For turf grass, the, um, this is not an area of my expertise, so I always rely on our turf pathologist to kind of confirm these things. And he actually developed the, the lists and you can find them more complete on our bolos on our website. But as soil temperatures rise, we'll likely see fairy ring symptoms appearing, especially if we have a wet spring and this can occur on any different kind of turf that there is. The cool season lawns, especially tall fescue, can see some yellow patch as we get into the spring. And then in the spring, as the Bermuda grass and the zoysia are starting to green up, areas that were infected last fall by certain fungi will fail to green up where they were infected and then winter killed. And so you get what we call spring dead spot. And finally, there's a disease called large patch, it used to be lumped in with brown patch um, tall fescue because it's a similar host, I'm sorry, similar fungus that causes it. But this is a disease of warm season grasses when they're under stress from cool weather. And information about these, a lot more photos, 
recommendations for management and so forth can be found at the turffiles.ncsu.edu website. I really recommend that one. And I think, let's see here. I will stop sharing and take a look at the chat here. Uh, okay, what can be done if Indian hawthorn shows the leaf spot? Well, there, there's not a whole lot you can do. Some have said that severe pruning in the winter, I'd say it's probably too late for that now, can help reduce it. This is not one that is going to overwinter in the fallen leaves like we do see with some diseases. As I recall, it's more in the actual twigs and the, and the leaves that are hanging on the plant. Obviously, you're already going to be doing things like avoiding uh, water splash and overhead irrigation on them, but we can't do much about the rain. We do need it. Um, and then so that you're resilient, you're really reduced to um, looking for not, excuse me, looking for less susceptible varieties of the Indian hawthorn when you're planting. If you wanted to use fungicides, you could use those, but it would have to be done during uh, many months of the year because it's going to be active in the spring and also in the fall. In the coldest part of the winter and the hottest part of the summer, it won't be, but there's just so many months where it's active that you would be spraying quite a bit. So that's a, that's a hard one to answer. Um, where can I find the best way to treat each of these if found? Unfortunately, there's no one good resource for that. And we want to always emphasize the importance of integrated pest management. So when you say treat, you want to think about all kind of cultural as well as chemical things that you can do. For example, with the phytophthora, there was the resistant plants, there's raising the beds, there's avoiding overwatering and so forth. The, um, there are some fact sheets out there for these, and some of them we've talked about in more detail on our plants, pests, and pathogen sessions. So you could go back and see when we've talked about a particular disease of interest and, and go and look up that recording. And of course, you can contact us at the clinic, and we'll try and help you out. Um, there's also some information in your Master Gardener handbook if you want to look at the disease chapter there. Uh, okay, see so Caroline put a uh, the list of the publications, so thank you for that. Um, and to search, I didn't even know about this impact extension org search to search across uh, fact sheets across the US, so that's good as well. Do be careful because not all information applies in all regions. So you wanna look for things that are close to our area if possible, if you don't find an NC State publication. Uh, I read somewhere that there is a Ligustrum blight. Is, I, I imagine you, Doris, mm, were talking about a blight, and I have not heard of one on Ligustrum. So if you have any more information, you find that again, feel free to contact us and, and we'll try and help you evaluate that. All right, if there are no other questions, I will let Charlotte take it back over. And again, congratulations to you, Charlotte. It, uh, it sounds like more work, but more power to you and uh, well-deserved. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mike. I actually had a, a question or something um, I was gonna ask you to add a little more information on was the spot anthracnose on dogwood. Every year at this time, we get a lot of questions about anthracnose and dogwoods and the difference between spot anthracnose and dogwood anthracnose. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about spot anthracnose and its threat to overall dogwood health compared to dogwood anthracnose? Sure, yeah, that's a, that's a good point to bring up. There's really almost nothing that they have in common, except that the, the type of spore structure that they produce is similar, and that's where the name anthracnose comes from. They're fungi that produce a cervulae, but one of them is 
caused by Elsinoe corni, that's the spot anthracnose, and the other is a discula destructiva, which causes the dogwood anthracnose. And that uh, is a, actually a canker disease. So they will get down into the, into the trunk even of the tree. The symptoms are different. You'll get dieback, you may get water sprouts coming up, you can get leaf blotches. Uh, the dogwood spot anthracnose will cause the spots on the, on the um, showy bracts, but if they're in great enough numbers, they'll make the, make the flowers unsightly. It can also cause some leaf spots, but they don't usually um, really get your attention. So that is more of a cosmetic disease, whereas the dogwood anthracnose can actually kill a tree. The reassuring thing here is that we have not seen, well, two reassuring things. One is for everyone in the Piedmont and in the coastal plain that we don't really see dogwood anthracnose except in the, in the mountains. And the second reassuring thing for everyone in the state is that we've really seen very little of it. I can't remember the last time I diagnosed dogwood anthracnose. In fact, I may not have in the last 12 years since I've been in the current position. So it's a disease that's not that prevalent. Um, certainly if you have reason to suspect it, we can take a look. But uh, again, it's, a, it's one that does have potential to do a lot, of, a lot of damage, but we haven't been seeing it a lot lately. All right, that's good news. Good to hear. The mosquitoes might be out, but we don't really have to worry that much about dogwood anthracnose. Right, yes, so, on, on your list of right. concerns, that would be um, important to, to help people understand that the common names are similar, but they're two very different diseases. Yes, for sure. All right, thank you so much. I did see one last, last question came, came in the chat that said, um, I raise honeybees and have fig and pear trees. What can be used to deter disease and not harm the bees? I'll just mention, I'll get, get you to add in comments, Mike, but I'll say, I would start with saying, well, what diseases are you trying to deter? And, you know, do they need to be treated? And then anytime you use any pesticide, always read the label. The label will have a statement uh, if it is harmful to bees. That information should be on the label. So please always read the labels of any pesticides, which would include insecticides, fungicides, or herbicides that you apply. Read the labels thoroughly for information about harm to bees and other organisms and protecting yourself. Yes, thank you, Charlotte. And I, I want to echo the part about what are you trying to prevent? I, I am kind of a minimalist when it comes to fungicide applications or uh, for, for disease control. The, the exception is if you're trying to raise fruits and if you have uh, any kind of poor tolerance for losing fruits to, to damage from diseases and insects, then you do need that spray program, preventive spray program in place. Other than that, there are really only select situations where you would want to use fungicides preventively. Uh, there aren't that many. The only one that comes to mind at the moment that would be a problem for bees potentially is neem oil, which is used as both an insecticide and, and a fungicide. In general, though, the, the plant disease management chemistries are not going to be uh, an issue for, for bees as far as I know, except for, like I say, the neem oil. They can be sometimes problems for, let's say, aquatic life. So if you're using them around a pond or or a resource like that, you want to you want to be careful. But it goes back to read that label. All right, thank you so much, Mike, um, and thank you, Matt, for the insect bolos, and thank you both for uh, sharing everyone the good news um, about my uh, appointment. So I appreciate that you caught me off guard. <laughs> it surprised me when that slide popped up. Um, so I appreciate everybody's congratulations. We're, um, we, we're, we're gonna it move on. Surprise. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, we're gonna move on to our plant these instead feature. So this is something we started. Uh, that's new for this year. We started last month, um, and this is gonna be a monthly feature where we talk about alternatives to problem-prone species commonly planted in North Carolina landscapes. Because one of the most important decisions you can make uh, that will affect the health of the plant and your need to ever do anything, uh, especially pesticide-wise to it, is what you actually choose. Um, do you choose a variety that is uh, suited to our 
climate that performs well in the southeast and suited to your landscape conditions. So today we're going to talk about a plant that you are probably seeing everywhere in bloom right now, Bradford pear. Um, and we're saying don't plant Bradford pear, even though it has been extremely popular since the 1960s for quite a few reasons. You know, it blooms really early when we're so eager to see color. Um, it does have great and very reliable fall color. People, especially um, landscapers, landscape architects, love that formal kind of lollipop shape, that, that very uh, full rounded shape it has. It is adaptable and very tough. It can be grown all across the United States, and you can see it all across the United States. Um, and it has great pest and disease res resistance overall. Um, that doesn't mean it's completely problem-free. Um, so two major issues, really serious problems we have with Bradford pear are that one, it self-destructs. So <laughs> many uh, nurserymen have described that as being a good quality because you sell them and then you sell them again. But um, we, we want to plant trees, especially uh, when we're planting trees, we want things that are going to be very long lived and provide ecosystem services for many, many years um, and not be something that we have to replace um, within say 10 or 15 years, which is pretty typical with Bradford pear. <clears throat> what gives them that very uniform shape is the fact that they branch um, very profusely from, from just kind of a single point or, or a lot of branching happens at one place. As a result, the angles, the branches come off of the trunk, that's called the crotch angle, um, tend to be very narrow and those are very weak. So when you get any extra pressure from wind, from ice, or just a bigger tree, a larger tree in the weight of the limbs, they will split and fall apart, which is what you see here in this picture, which is a, a little bit pale, but um, I think you can make out that the tree, we've got one half of it over here and one half of it here is split off. So this has happened to many Bradford pears in the last, you know, 20, 30 years, um, especially here in North Carolina. We can have ice, we can have wind from thunderstorms or hurricanes or tropical storms. And, you know, I think we probably have been aware of this issue, you know, maybe longer than some other people because of our, our climate conditions that um, tend to cause this. So we don't want trees that self-destruct. We want trees that'll be really long-lived. Um, and the other serious problem um, of growing concern with Bradford pear is it becoming invasive. Um, throughout the Middle Atlantic and Eastern United States, uh, even on the West Coast, um, we're seeing Bradford pear seed in um, a lot of areas. Actually, <clears throat> the seedlings that are coming up <clears throat> excuse me, aren't true Bradford pear because Bradford is that cultivar that's been um, propagated and grafted to, to maintain that genetic integrity. What we're seeing are seedlings, so it's referred to as calorie pear when we see the seedlings out there um, for Pyrus caloriana. So one thing that's really interesting about um, Bradford pear, which is a selection of calorie pear, um, is the, the Bradford pear itself is fairly self-sterile, or is believed to be self-sterile, so it, it will not pollinate itself. So if all we had were Bradford pears and that was it, we wouldn't see this issue. But what we find is Bradford pear is grafted on rootstock. And sometimes that rootstock shoots away. Sometimes the, the grafted part dies and the rootstock grows away. So then the rootstock is able to pollinate the other Bradford pears in the area. Also, because of this serious issue with uh, the tree splitting and falling apart, other varieties of calorie pear have been introduced that don't have that type of branching structure. And as more different cultivars of Bradford pear have been put around the landscape, they are also pollinating Bradford pear. So we've kind of created a perfect storm um, for pollination and getting the seeding of, of uh, calorie pear. In natural areas right now, you know, if you drive along highways, you will probably see lots of them along the sides of the roads. Um, and out in pastures and edges of the woods, um, any disturbed area, they will tend to come up and then they produce tons and tons of seeds, <clears throat> the seedling trees themselves. So it just spreads from there and you can get really dense thickets of them. Um, and I've added some links that, uh, to some different sites that talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, the invasive concerns of Bradford pear or calorie pear that you can learn more about. And these slides will be available. In fact, I posted in the chat an archive, the archive to the plant these instead slides where you can go and see these actual slides and click on the links. Um, so you can read more about that. And I'll also mention, if you really want to read an extremely detailed history of Bradford pear and how it made its way to the United States, 
there was an article in the Washington Post in 2018 <clears throat> that chronicles the journey from, uh, from China where it is native and how it was brought to the United States specifically to um, improve pear resistance to fire blight. So you can learn all about it and learn its development and history. All right, so now we want to talk about what can you plant instead, since we don't really want to be planting bread for pear, even though they are still grown by, uh, and, and available. We don't want to put these in the landscape. So we are looking for other kind of small to medium sized early blooming trees, um, and one that um, really jumps out and very early bloomer is the Okami cherry. In general, we we don't think of cherry trees as being very tough and resilient, but this Okami cherry, um, which is a hybrid, um, is uh, defies that kind of categoriz categorization of cherries. Um, it is very tough. It is actually even used some in parking lots and really tough sites in a home landscape. <clears throat> it would be very happy, and it is a really early bloomer. They've already bloomed in my area, um, and some are still blooming right now here in the central part of North Carolina. These lovely pink blossoms well before the leaves come out. It has a, a similar habit, certainly not as tight um, as the Bradford pear, but kind of more of an upright habit like that. Um, and it's just a beautiful tree to bring that touch of spring when you most want to see it, um, and a, a really tough one as well. Of course, you always want to do some research, choose the right plant for the site. There is, there's never going to be just a one perfect replacement. We, and in fact, we don't ever really want to see this is the one plant that everybody plants. We want to see a tremendous amount of diversity. Um, that is a, a good practice for integrated pest management is not to have the same cultivar everywhere um, to have a variety of plants and plants suited to the site conditions. Um, another um, lovely early blooming tree is the Cornelian cherry, which actually is not a cherry, it's a type of dogwood, <clears throat> a cornus mass. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, one minute, I'm going to take a swallow of water to see if I can finally clear my throat. And for um, Cornelian cherry, um, there is a variety named Spring Glow, which was selected by the J.C. Ralston Arboretum. Um, and it was selected because it does well in the south here in North Carolina. Cornelian cherry typically likes slightly cooler conditions, but um, the cultivar spring glow will do well even in uh, zone 8, zone 7 and 8. So this is a picture I took at the J.C. Ralston Arboretum a few years ago of Cornelian cherry in full bloom, and I believe that was actually in early to mid-February, so another early bloomer. And then last of all is one that's not necessarily grown for its blossoms. If you're looking more to the fall color side of things, um, trident maple, Acer bergerianum, is a smaller maple, um, very, very tough. You can see here in a parking lot situation. Um, and it has a similar kind of shape when it's grown uh, as a single trunk and um, can have really striking fall color on a small to medium sized tree. So these are just a few options you have to, to replace if you've got somewhere a Bradford pear is disintegrated and falling apart or you're looking for a nice fall, uh, early blooming tree or something for fall color, just a few options that are out there. If you're specifically looking for something native, there are quite a few options as well. I'll highlight redbud. Again, looking at those early bloomers, redbud is just starting to bloom now <clears throat> here in the Piedmont. You can see the buds uh, showing color, and it does bloom very similar time-wise with Bradford pear and before the leaves come out. Um, it does often grow with multiple trunks, uh, and if it's in more shade, it'll be a little more open growing. Um, you can uh, purchase it with single, uh, a single trunk, um, and um, in the sun, it tends to stay a little more compact and tighter. The typical red bud has just green heart-shaped leaves, which are pretty enough in themselves. There are cultivars available that have purple leaves or even golden colored leaves. So red bud is a real favorite and a fast grower. Another one to consider is service berry. And um, there's actually several species of service berry. The one pictured here um, is Amelanchier grand, cross grandiflora, which is a naturally occurring hybrid between two Amelanchier species, Labus and um, Arborea, 
And um, it is one that uh, tends to be a little more resilient in landscape conditions. There are some name varieties available that you can find. It uh, blooms just not quite yet blooming, but will be blooming very soon before the leaves come out again. You can see a close up of the flowers. It will then have fruit, which the birds absolutely love. Um, there are, can't, you know, there can be some issues with some foliage disease um, and and some uh, rust diseases on the fruit. So I wouldn't necessarily grow it reliably for the fruit, other than thinking, you know, the birds will really enjoy it. Um, but if you do get a few fruit, they are rather tasty, kind of a blueberry cross cherry flavor. But the seeds are a little bit large in there, so you have a, the seeds that um, you can you can feel as you eat it. Um, but it is a lovely um, small tree, and it can have really nice fall color. Um, so those are a couple of native options. There are other things out there for sure, especially if you're looking for blooms later in the season. And I encourage everyone to explore the plants that are in the plant toolbox, um, the Extension Gardener plant toolbox. And the neat thing is if you go, when you visit the site and you go to the Find a Plant, you'll have this great long column with all kinds of things you can select and you can narrow down very precisely what you're looking for by the growing conditions you have, you know, whether it's sunny or whether it's in part shade or hey, you have poor drainage or it's a dry site. Um, you can indicate from the landscape design feature you're looking for. So if you look just small trees alone, there's 266 and then you can further narrow that down by you know, the site conditions or other parameters you're looking for. There's 133 flowering trees um, there in the, in the plant um, toolbox that you can search and further refine. Um, if you're specifically interested in native plants, if you go to the whole plant trait section, um, there is a, a plant type that it says native plant. There's actually over a thousand native plants there. If you click both flowering tree and native plants, you get 64 options. So lots of cool things to explore and you can get, you know, specific recommendations for what you're looking for. Around your growing conditions, you can also look for plants that attract specific wildlife or resistant to specific challenges and just lots more um, options there. So I encourage everybody to check that out. And I'll finish up. I've got a couple of announcements. First, I want to give a shout out to the Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association of Wake County who uh, made a, a donation to the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Endowment um, to honor their award winners. So we appreciate them um, thinking about their volunteers and honoring their award winning volunteers that way. Um, and we really appreciate your donation, which will continue to support the Master Gardener program for years to come because donations to the endowment, um, of course, stay there in the endowment and generate uh, interest that we're able to use um, to do things like actually pay students to help um, edit our subtitles on recordings, uh, such as our plants, pests, and pathogens recordings. Want to let everybody know that it's um, it's not quite too late. These classes did start yesterday, but if you are interested in sharpening up your plant ID skills and learning about a wide range of plants that grow well um, in North Carolina and pretty much you know kind of the the southeast eastern U.S., um, the online self-paced courses and plant ID, the extension gardener courses that are offered in partnership between NC State University, Department of Horticultural Science, and Longwood Gardens. Um, there is a whole series that just started. There's actually three different courses going on now. Um, yesterday was the first day, but most of them I believe you could still register for, or you can plan to register later. These same courses will be offered in the summer starting July 12th, and again in the fall starting October 18th. Um, so there is a link that you can go and learn more um, about those. I'll drop that in the chat really quick. And we encourage you to think about those classes, there is a discount for Master Gardener volunteers. Also, um, we want everyone to mark your calendar for the International Master Gardener Conference, which is coming up September 12th through the 17th later this year. It will be virtual, um, and the registration is going to open really soon, April 5th. We know the registration fee itself will be $150. There may be some additional um, workshops and things you can sign up for that um, we'll have uh, additional fees, but um, we don't have quite all the details on that yet. But we encourage everybody to visit the site. From the website, you can um, sign up to receive updates. 
and they'll let you know anything that happens when registration is officially open and when you can go and sign up. They have a lot of really exciting speakers, including Bree Arthur here from North Carolina, um, and we encourage you to explore all the things that are, are being offered as part of the International Master Gardener Conference. If you are a member of the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association, you are encouraged to apply for a partial scholarship. Um, there are a limited number available. The applications available on their website, ncemgva.org. The applications are due by May 1. If you're not already a member, you can actually go to their website and join and then apply. We appreciate the North Carolina Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Association making those scholarships available. Also, as part of the International Master Gardener Conference, um, there will be the International Master Gardener Search for Excellence Award program this year, and those applications are submitted online. I'll drop the link to those as well as the conference itself in the chat. Um, they will be due May 1st, and they are looking for applications um, for projects that were undertaken between 2018 and 2020 and have completed at least you know, a full year. Um, there are specific categories you can submit applications in, which are listed here and that you can see on their website. Um, and we're really excited because North Carolina has typically done very well with our International Search for Excellence and the last time it was held, it's held every two years. We had two first place recipients, both the Master Gardener volunteers in Guilford County and Dare County were first place winners um, in different categories. So we encourage everybody to consider applying and we want to see uh, more North Carolina winners this year. And just so you know, if you do apply and you are either a first, second, or third place recipient, you will be expected to provide a short video about your project, which could be a narrated PowerPoint. Um, so we don't want that to stop anybody from submitting an application. Just, just make sure you know um, the expectations of award recipients. So we hope uh, many of you will consider making that application and look forward to seeing you again next month, April 27th, where we will have uh, Matt and Mike tell us about current pest and plant disease issues. And just see if we have any questions from the chat. I see there was a question about trees that like wet feet in southeastern North Carolina. Uh, that would be a great, um, you could do a wonderful search in the plant toolbox for that. You could choose, you know, poor drainage, um, I think it, the coastal plain, and um, you could do trees, you could do small trees, you could do flowering trees. So I'm sure you could find some great options through the plant toolbox for that. And um, there was a statement about some states are offering incentives for removing Bradford pear and have a do not sell order. Um, any chance our state legislature would approve either of these approaches? Um, I don't know. That would be something that would probably the North Carolina Department of Agriculture would handle, um, or or you know, or or some. I'm not sure how that how that actual process would start as far as something going through the legislature. Uh, in general, I don't. North Carolina has not passed a lot of regulations. I'll say on um, limiting plants other than those that are. Um, noxious weeds, you know, considered North Carolina or federal noxious weeds. Okay, I think that's everything in the chat. We really appreciate everybody joining us today. Um, until next time, we encourage you to visit the playlist on YouTube where you can watch recordings from uh, past years. We have the index of recordings if you'd like to see a list um, a chronological list, and then you can see our current this year's schedule um, and find recordings for this year as well posted at go.ncsu.edu slash ppp. We hope everyone has a wonderful day, and thanks again to Matt and Mike and to Inga, and thank you to Caroline for helping monitor the, the chat and keep us up to date on questions. We will be sending the recording out uh, within the next few days and getting it posted um, on our playlist. So encourage everybody to look for those resources there. Thanks, everybody. Have a good yeah, month. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Charlotte and Caroline, for the help. Absolutely.
absolutely. I'll play our music to send us off and wish everybody a great rest of the day and rest of the week.